we'll open in prayer, and then we'll have uh, just one announcement. So let's just uh, open it prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you hold the whole universe in your hand, that you are in control of all things, that you know all things, and yet in all that you reach down and, and love each and every single one of us. You know every detail of our lives. You care for us, you love us, and you call us into a deeper relationship. Father, we want to respond to you, to your invitation. We want to say yes to you. We want to come closer to you in this afternoon. We just pray that our time of worship, teaching, prayer, and fellowship, that you will be with us, we will be with you. Father, we just want to experience your presence. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your love for us. We pray these things. A little bit, I want to do a little review, and we're going, all right, and you know, God's seventh day of creation um, was actually Adam's first, Adam and Eve's first day on earth, if you think about it, really, it's the first, first full day on earth, is God's seventh day of creation, and what's the first thing they did on their first full day on earth? They entered into God's rest. That's the first thing they did. They rested with God, and they enjoyed God. They enjoyed each other, and they enjoyed creation. That's the first thing they did on their first full day here on earth. This is the, the apex, or the, the pinnacle of creation. Is this, this completeness, this wholeness, this perfection that we had with God. We were present with God. We're, we're singing, you know. God, there's only one way, right? There's only one way. It's into your holy of holies to be with you, God. That, there's where perfection is. There's where wholeness is. Uh, there's a Hebrew word that we've been pounding over and over again, and, I, and I'm hoping that you got it. You know, we centered on this word uh, to describe this, uh, this beautiful scene of man and woman together with God in the garden, the, the perfect garden. And uh, resting together, enjoying God's finished work of creation. And that word is shalom. Peace. We, some of you know what is peace. It's the fullness of life. It's well-being. It's flourishing. See, this was God's intended scene. This is what God meant. This is his intention when he created earth and created us. Uh, Genesis 2, 7 and 8, 15 and 22. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. Verse 15, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So he created man, and then he puts man in a nice garden to tend it, to watch over it, to manage it. 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. So here we have, we have man, relationship with God, man, relationship with earth and creation, and man in relationship with each other, man and woman in relationship. This is shalom, this, is, this was wholeness and perfection. They were placed in God's garden to work it and to take care of it, literally to, to service it, to make it more. We were created in God's image. God is a creating God. He, he had put into us his ability to create. We were going to continue to do more. And we have done more. Think about this building here. Who else, who else on the planet, what other species on the planet can create something like this and build something like this? Nobody. We do. As image bearers of God, we have created and we continue to create. You know, these, uh, these are the same words used to describe the work of the priests later in Israel. It says keeping, keeping, and servicing uh, history. And, and these words uh, were used for the priests that they were supposed to service and to keep the tabernacle. 
and the temple. The language used here is not of a kingling, we're not kings, but of like a priestly mediation. Like we, we're working between God and his creation. That's, that's, that's who we are, to work with creation as God's mediators and, and, and be in between, okay? So what we have then is this understanding that we are also priests. Each one of us are priests. Now this language describes the importance of and this, the sacred nature of our human task. This is why we are here on earth. We're called to serve the earth, to reverence it, to respect it. And we are called to keep the earth, and which is to conserve and to preserve it. And the earth was created by God's design to be wisely cared for us, or by us. So our purpose is to be king and priests under God's rule. That's our purpose, to be king and priests under God's rule and direction. We are to enjoy a relationship with God. We are to enjoy a relationship with each other. And we're to enjoy a relationship with creation. We're to enjoy these things. When these relationships are all right, these three relationships are all right, then all of God's creation will know shalom. So that's the intent. The destruction, you know we don't have shalom. Well, what happened? You know what happened. The destruction of Shalom occurred when Satan convinced us that God cannot be trusted. That's when we began to wonder, well, gee, maybe we don't need to obey God. And the relationship, of course, began to suffer. When we, when Adam and Eve decided to disobey God, the relationship was separated. They separated themselves from God. And, and what happened? Most of you know the story in the garden. What they do? They hid from God. They actively, they actively kept themselves from God. This isn't a right, right relationship. Imagine if I come home and Mary hides. That's not, that's not an okay relationship. If she needs to hide, is it? Evil wants us to remain separated from God. That's what Satan wants to do. That's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to remain separated from God and he'll find a way, he'll find a way for us to remain that way. He does it either by convincing us that there is no God or he convinces us that God doesn't care or that we must achieve our own shalom in our own way by becoming our own definition of God, or who God is. To try to achieve shalom or salvation through our own efforts is to reject the very nature and character of who God is. We can't reach that point and have a relationship with someone if we reject who that person is, who God is. It's impossible. We can't say, yeah, I'll have a relationship with you, but this is how it's going to be. I, I can't even do that, again, with Mary. Mary can't do that with me. I'll have a relationship with you, but this is how, this is, this is who you are. This is who I need for you to be. It doesn't work that way. Because, why? Because God in His infinite wisdom knows what works best for us. He defines, not us. We don't define, He defines. He just wants us to be close to Him. Remember, Satan's tactic is to say that God is not trustworthy. Well, the only relationships that I try to define are the ones where I don't trust the other one. And that's what Satan does. He tries to tell us that God is not trustworthy. Does He really love you? Is he really going to come through for you? These questions that he puts in our mind. The only way to a right relationship with God is through Jesus. 
We just celebrated Christmas, and we understand that. We acknowledge He is God, we realize He cares, and we submit ourselves to Him. And the reality is, is there really is no other way. It's Jesus. We broke the relationship. God sent Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for us. And then He rose again to show that He was God. Power over death. And He said we just need to follow Him. There's no way to the Father but by him. Jesus. So when we submit ourselves to him, we say we're going to follow him, then what? Well, Paul says in Romans, he says, you know, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds. But how does this happen? How does renewing of our minds happen? It's a question I, you know, I considered. And I, I, then I considered water. I thought of water, and you know, you cannot change water by telling it to change. You know, there's nothing you can do with water, and you know, water can't change in and of itself. You just can't. It won't happen. The only way it changes is by putting it near something. Steam comes by putting water near heat. Ice comes from putting water in extreme cold. The water has done nothing to change itself. It's just been placed near something. And it has changed because of what it is near. Where water has put itself, or where we have put the water, and it, it has transformed itself. We are transformed by being near God. Shalom comes by being near God. We become near God. There is no physical garden by which we can we can go to be by God's presence, right? I mean, Adam and Eve, they, they disobeyed out of the garden. So where do we go to be near God? How do we get near God to experience Shalom? Even in this crazy, chaotic world, there is a place. And I think you know what that place is. It's our heart. Jesus talked about our hearts. It's our hearts. That's the place where we go to be near God. We put our hearts near God when we engage in activities that put us there. What are the activities that put us there? Well, one is worship. That was Tanya's prayer a few times over tonight was worship. Hear our worship. We're drawing. We're drawing ourselves to you, God. We want to be near you. It's through our worship. Prayer. Thanksgiving. Meditation. Fasting. These are things that we do that draw us close to God. Followers of Jesus call these types of activities, we call these things disciplines. I don't know how many of you have heard that term, disciplines? Uh, the native English speakers, I'm, I'm sure, disciplines. These are the things that we do to draw ourselves closer to God. Prayer, worship, meditation, solitude, uh, giving, thanksgiving, service. There's all kinds of different things that we can do to draw near God. Romans 12, 1 through 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God... Not, okay. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Who, who's doing the changing? God. God's doing the changing. How do we have God do the changing? We got to be near God. We have to be near God. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You will be able to see how trustworthy God is when you get close to Him, and He begins to transform your mind, and as Paul says, 
changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 19. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Where is God? God is right here. He's waiting for us to do what? To draw near to Him. We have these disciplines that, that help us to do that. And then we can be transformed as we draw near to Him. As we look back over the previous year, can we say that we have become more like Jesus? Have we been transformed? Are we thinking differently? Do we have a greater passion for Him? Do we, do we want to be in His presence more than ever before? What is it that we desire? What is it that you want? Is it God? Or is it something or someone else? These are the questions to ask ourselves. Now some of you may be sitting here and you're afraid to be found out. Okay? And what I mean is if you love God, you want to serve Jesus, but when people say, oh, I hunger for God, I hunger for God, you're like, I don't hunger for God. There's a, I don't have that emotion for God. What's, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with me that I don't, when so many, there are people that they talk about these lovely languages that, oh, they hunger for God. What about me? What's going on? I think that this message in a lot of ways is for you. Disciplines help us to develop a hunger for God. Okay? They're, they're called disciplines for a reason because you have to choose to do them. <laughs> Alright? Uh, they're not called the awesomes of the... You know, I don't know what, what, what other word would we use to make it all. We love to do that, you know. They're called the disciplines. And there's a reason they call them disciplines, because there's something that we have to choose to do to engage God. Now, I don't hunger for God. I'll tell you what, nearly 10 years ago, I was confronted by doctors about my weight, my obesity. And, and I had to give up sugar. I knew I had to give up sugar. As some of you can imagine, it was a difficult process. How many people are sugar people? Anybody here is sugar people? Yeah, all right. How many are salt people? Yeah, you're either a salt person or sugar person. I'm a real Or both, huh? Oh, man. You got it really tough. All right. I'll be praying especially for you. Um, it's a difficult process. I crave sugar. I, I bragged about you know, eating a French soap pie, I could eat the whole thing in one sitting and wash it down with a coke. All right? All right? Yeah, that's with me. <laughs> that's with me. Nothing wrong with that, okay? You know, eat a whole box of Hostess, right? You eat five of the six packages, and then if the six package is there, I can't really eat it, but it's such a waste to throw it away, so I'll eat it. Right? That's a problem. That's a problem. I craved sugar. It was going to kill me. It's going to kill me. I had to decide to leave sugar and eat healthier. Now, it wasn't like I sat down one day and said, I'm going to get healthier and I'm done with sugar. It was a daily decision. Often hourly. And many times, minute by minute. I, and I don't know how many can identify with me where you're sitting down, you're doing something, and you automatically, without thinking, you start heading to wherever the candy is. Anybody? And you're halfway across the room going, what am I doing? I'm doing what i always done, and I'm doing what I, I crave. It's the easy thing to do. After a few months, I noticed something, though. I noticed that my palate, you know, what tastes good to me, it's called the palate, Changed. I hungered for healthier food. Sugar was not satisfying. 
In fact, I read something sweet when that's a little too sweet for me. I never thought I'd ever say that. It was too sweet. It was sufficient for the occasional treat. But here's the thing about discipline. Obviously, you can see it's easy to slide back into these habits. And I allow that to occur. But the hunger can change. I changed my own hunger for healthier food once I decided on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So I don't know how many, three months, and you think, how many minutes are in three months? I mean, that seems like that's how much decisions I have to make around staying away from sugar. But it was a discipline. And it changed my hunger. Discipline helps change what we hunger for. It does not happen overnight. It becomes easier. But as my sugar illust habit illustrates, we have to remain active in our discipline to keep our hunger focused. I let it slide. Oh, I have a second piece of cake. I'll have a Coke. Okay? John Piper writes this, Desire for other things, that's the enemy. And the only weapon that will triumph is a deeper hunger for God. We desire other things, and John Piper is saying, the only weapon we have is a deeper hunger for God. The weakness of our hunger for God is not because he is not... He's unsavory or he doesn't taste well, it's because we keep ourselves stuffed with other things. Perhaps then, the denial of our stomach's appetite for food might express or even increase our soul's appetite, our hunger for God. I'm saying that really we can, we can, we can easily replace God with other things and not have a hunger for God. What's at stake here, as uh, Piper continued, is not just the good of our souls, but also the glory of God. God is most glorified in us. God is most praiseworthy. He's, he's shown his, his wonderful nature. Every, everything about who he is is shown in us when we're most satisfied in him. The fight of faith is a fight to feast in all that God is in is for us in Christ. So when we are worshiping today and we, and we realize that, you know what, things don't always go the way that we want them to. That was the prayer. They don't always go the way we want to. But God is on the throne and God still can be glorified here through our worship. And we become centered again on Him and who He is. And we find Him to be trustworthy when we do that. What we hunger for most, we worship. Paul, in Philippians 3, 8, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This is the path we will try to follow. Everything becomes secondary. In order to eat healthier, I actually had to give up something. It wasn't just a, I need to eat healthier. There was a discipline involved in choosing not to eat sugar. Oops! Yes. In choosing not to eat sugar. I developed a different hunger then. Some of you might have read like a celebration of discipline. There's others that would talk about different types of disciplines. The disciplines of the denials and the active disciplines, okay, and things of that nature. We won't get into that other than to say that that was part of the process for me. And Piper's talking about these things too. We fill ourselves with other things and we no longer have a hunger for God. And fasting, as he mentions quickly here, is, is one of those things that illustrates to us where our hunger is. Where our hunger. So how are we to live now? We can look back at the Garden of Eden and looking forward to the return of Christ and be with him, and being with him forever in a new Jerusalem. So we can look back and we can say, okay, this is what God had intended. This was Shalom. And this is what Jesus said that he's bringing, the new Jerusalem. Shalom. We can look towards that. We see what it was, and that's what he intends for us. It's still there. To be near God. To be with God. To hunger for God. 
We don't need to wait for Jesus to return before we begin to experience his presence and the fullness of life in heaven. Remember Jesus' announcement when he started his ministry? He goes, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, it is at hand. See, Jesus' purpose for coming was to reconcile, to restore our relationship. And said in the garden, those relationships were broken, and Jesus is back to re restore the relationship, our relationship, and the world's relationship with God to himself, to shalom, to the life he designed for us originally in the garden. It's the same life we look forward to in the New Jerusalem. Shalom. And what makes it shalom is this right relationship with God, a right relationship with each other, a right relationship with God's creation. Life of fullness, wholeness, and completeness is available now. We know that we can experience these things in, uh, that God and Jesus promised in this present evil age. It's like we're behind enemy lines, okay? We're behind enemy lines. The enemy does not want us to trust God, does not want us to be drawn towards God, does not want us to hunger for God. But we can live this life right in the middle of a battlefield, a life of shalom, right in the middle of the battlefield. Think of David's words in Psalm 23 when he says, You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows with blessings. Wow. Imagine Jesus, you know, he's setting up a banqueting table, complete with a tablecloth, and the, just, the, 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 the candlesticks, and you know, everything is just perfect. The flowers, you have the, the food that's just stacked, and it's just... It smell, you know how it is. It's more than a scene, and you smell it when you walk in, right? I mean, you can almost hear how good the food tastes, and just the whole everything. Is. This is what he said for us. And you imagine the rage of the enemy at the audacity of Christ's invitation for us and all nations to be invited to this table to enjoy it. To enjoy his presence. The enemy doesn't want that. The enemy does not want us to experience what God has for us. The enemy wants us to have a nice little head knowledge. Yeah, God did this, Jesus got in the cross, da 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 da, whatever, without having an experience within our heart of having a hunger for God or being drawn towards Him, a mind that's transformed. But that's what God wants that for us. He, uh, I understand the abundance of the table represents the fullness of the presence of God himself. He is who we feast on. He is the bread of life, the new wine. He is the one we want for our for. It's all about him. Ephesians 2, 6 through 10. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point us to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Paul is talking in the present tense. So that all can see. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. And this is important. Disciplines are not salvation, right? That's something different. It's something completely different. God has done the work for us, and now we can sit at his table. But to keep us at the table, to enjoy the table, we engage in disciplines. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God is active now and is asking us to be active with him, to draw close to him. 
you know, I want you to remember something. I, it, 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 these pivotal moments in a walk with Christ we see in, in His Word. We're around a table. He, he invited Matthew and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They were at a table. Let's have a meal together. The Pharisees, you know, they had a, they, they had a meal together. Mm -hmm. The last, we call it the Last Supper. We, 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 we observe it once a month, communion. And it's around the tables. It's the relationships. What is the most painful part? of not being in whatever country you're from during holiday seasons? It's not, oh, but it would be nice to have the turkey. I understand that. And my mom's red cabbage, for anyone that understands what that is, and the cranberry jello or whatever. But what I miss is the relationships, the table, being together in the fullness the perfection that's there when you're in right relationship with those around the table with you. And God, that's a metaphor for who God is. He invites us to be at the table. He uses the parable, the wedding feast, and says, imagine the, the, the king's going out and he say, come, everyone come, come join me for the big wedding feast and nobody comes. The A-listers don't come. So he sends out again because he's he wants people to enjoy his presence to enjoy him and so he invites and others do come take advantage of the disciplines because they work in two ways they help us to enter more fully into the fullness of God's presence to enjoy him and secondly they help us to bring our fleshly life under control and to break habits and sins that are hindering us from drawing closer to God. Prayer, worship, thanksgiving, these are for our benefit. God designed us and he had these things in mind and the Bible talks about these things. But for our benefit, we, when we draw closer to him, we hunger for him. When we engage in these disciplines, so, oh, prayer, oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta do that, oh, man. Oh, oh. Tell you what, if you're not in the habit of doing that, the first month is going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. But then what happens? You begin to look forward to it. Not every day. And every day there's going to be a little voice saying, no, you don't really need to do it today. But it draws you close to God and you you hunger for him. You hunger for him. In uh, January, we have a number of things happening in January that I want you to be aware of. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you uh, that we have a devotional. And it's, it's a daily devotional and it's written by people within our church. And it said, I love every one of them. I've read every one of them twice. And I, I'm just encouraged by each one. And because each one is a different perspective of a walk with God. And so we have a bunch of them in the back. Grab one if you use paper copies. Otherwise, you'll be, you uh, can get one emailed to you every day. Just that day, every day. All right, and if you are getting one emailed every day and you don't want to, just unsubscribe, okay? But uh, we'll be uh, using our mailing list to do that. But uh, you know, a lot of people, many people, if not most people, prefer a paper copy. So please do that. The other, other thing to be aware of is that we're gonna do and ask you to involve yourself in an in a, a ICF, a church-wide fast. Okay. Uh, Paul, Next week, Paul then said, we'll talk more in detail about fasting. What fasting is, the purpose of fasting, things of that nature. Okay? But we want you to be aware now. Uh, we will start the 21-day uh, fast for all the church on uh, January 10th through the 31st. So 
uh, just be aware of that. It's a couple weeks from now. But on the back sheet, on the back table, we have a sheet. It's called Slowing Down to Fast. The ICF 21 Day Fast, January 10th through 31. You see a piece of paper there. Uh, I printed about 30 copies of these, front and back. And, and what they do is they just talk about um, the elements of fasting. And so why fasting the, um, and what helps to, to achieve a successful fast? I can use that word, successful. Um, and then on the back, you'll see some biblical examples of fasting. Uh, what makes a biblical fast. And then finally, um, there's some practical uh, preparation. So if you've never done a fast before, actually we, we gave you uh, two good links. Uh, I, I believe everyone should be on the internet by now. So uh, uh, it, it, there's some good links there that talk about fasting. And I would encourage you to read through this. It's a very, it's a very good document about fasting, to educate yourself, even before next Sunday comes. And then finally, uh, during the time of our fasting, on Saturday evenings, we will be having a worship and prayer night. So, and they will happen here. So mark it on your calendars and your phones, or wherever you keep that stuff. Um, we will be doing that as a, as a church, uh, those Saturday nights. Yeah. yeah.